Hi, everybody. Hello. I'm so happy to be here today. So thank you for being here, and thanks to Debbie for, for having me here. Sound okay? Okay. Um, I like to be a casual speaker, so if you have a question that pops up while I'm talking, throw your hand up, because if it's a question that's um, come to you, it has probably, are you okay with that? It has probably come to other people's mind as well. I'll repeat. Hold it to the end. Okay, Debbie says hold it to the end. So we'll hold them to the end. Write them down with your pens. Okay, so um, some of the objectives today. We're gonna understand the difference between two terms that sound very similar, and that is hereditary and familial. So a lot of the times we use these terms to mean the same thing, so I'm gonna kind of pick them apart a little bit. We're gonna talk about um, early onset Alzheimer's disease and average onset or late onset Alzheimer's disease. We're gonna talk about genes that are responsible for hereditary Alzheimer's and genes that are responsible for um, familial or um, uh, modifier genes that may increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease. I'll go into that in more detail. And we're going to talk about genetic testing for Alzheimer's disease. Um, when to use it, when to not use it, when to consider maybe clinical trials, uh, when to go see a specialist, a genetic specialist. <coughs> I don't have any disclosures, so I need to say that. There's, I don't work for drug companies or anything like that either. Okay, so let's talk about hereditary and familial. The word hereditary um, refers to being something that's transmitted from a parent to an offspring, literally in the DNA or in our genes. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about it's in the genes and what's hereditary. And y'all know that we have our hair color, our eye color, um, the build of our bodies tends to run in families, and that's because we got it in our DNA. We have half of our DNA from our mother, half of our DNA came from our father. Even though we tend to say, oh, I look like my mom, I, I act like her, I got the same heart problem, sorry, that she got when, I, when, when she was 60, I have got it, so I'm just more like my mom, so I know I'm going to take the same course in life, health-wise, that my mom took. And the facts are, you're 50% mom, 50% dad. So just because you, you think you're more like your mom doesn't mean that you're definitely going to follow the path that she may have followed. Does that make sense? Okay, okay. Um, a lot of the times when I see, I see families in clinic, that's what they want to tell me. Oh, cancer's on dad's side, and I'm, I'm built like mom, so I don't think I'm going to have a higher risk for cancer since I'm more like my mom, and, and um, that's not the case, and that's not going to be the case with Alzheimer's disease either. Okay, what about the word familial? Um, it just means that something tends to occur in a family um, more frequently than by chance alone. So we can look at a family and see maybe there are a couple of relatives that have had Alzheimer's disease, but that certainly doesn't mean that it's hereditary and that it's being passed from generation to generation by a specific gene. So we can observe what I call familial clusters of certain conditions, but it sure does not mean that there's one gene that's causing it and guaranteeing it to occur in every family member. Okay, so generally we use hereditary when we're talking about a very specific gene or gene mutation that is responsible for a specific condition. And we use familial when we're talking about observing a cluster um, of some kind of condition or, or trait. So approximately 25% of Alzheimer's disease is considered familial. So 25% familial, 75% sporadic, okay? Um, often familial conditions are multifactorial, and that means that they're caused by a complex interaction 
of genes, environment, and lifestyle. And Alzheimer's, most of Alzheimer's falls into that, a complex combination of genes, environment, and lifestyle. So, um, you know what, I'm not flipping my, my talk any, so I apologize, y'all. I just got on a roll. Okay, um, so here's my pie chart, one of my pie charts. 25% of Alzheimer's familial, 75% is what we'll call isolated. So when is Alzheimer's disease truly hereditary? So this is where we're gonna talk about hereditary versus familial. When is it truly hereditary, meaning that it's caused by a gene mutation that's being passed through the family from generation to generation? And the answer to that is rarely, very rarely. Uh, we tend to see hereditary Alzheimer's disease in individuals or families that have early onset disease. Uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease, typically we see onset under age 65. Um, some, some experts will say under age 60 and then as young as 30 years old. So this is the less common version of Alzheimer's disease when we see early onset but this is the type that's most likely to be hereditary. 2% of all, all Alzheimer's is early onset hereditary disease. There's three genes that we've known about for quite a while actually that play a role in early onset hereditary Alzheimer's. And that's the PCN1, the PCN2, and the APP gene. And before I go into those three genes, I wanted to put a family tree. So you can't be a genetics expert and not put a family tree up. So here's our family tree for the day, um, also called a pedigree. So when you go meet with a genetics expert, they usually draw your family tree out. Um, so I'm gonna break it down for you and kind of tell you what all that means. Those are three generations, Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Three is the youngest generation. Roman numeral one is the oldest generation. Squares are males and circles are females. So if you look at Roman numeral one, they're married. And then those are their six children down below. Roman numeral two, those are the six offspring of that first generation. And um, the folks who are colored in black have a diagnosis of early, early onset Alzheimer's disease. So there's three folks there who have it. And they go in for genetic testing. We're actually able to identify that they have a gene mutation that's causing their Alzheimer's disease. And so you see the arrow there is pointed to a female with the number six beneath her, and she has a dot in there and what that dot means is that she had genetic testing too and she doesn't have Alzheimer's disease but she inherited that gene and will develop it in the future so what she did was go meet with some reproductive specialists and she actually went through a process to make sure that her babies don't inherit that gene mutation that's a whole nother talk we're not going to talk about it today but <laughs> She did take extra steps um, to make sure it stopped with her so that her um, future generations will not inherit that early onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, costs a lot of money and a lot of time, um, but, but that is something that she did with her child. So the dot is interesting because like I said, she has not developed Alzheimer's yet, but because her other family members did develop it and did go through genetic testing, she made the choice, you know what, I do want to know if I'm going to develop it. I do want the genetic test and that's why she's got the dot because she's got the gene but has not yet developed Alzheimer's disease. She, this is one of those rare families though, one of those 2% of all Alzheimer's um, that has the early onset hereditary form. So there's my pedigree, my family tree. Okay, if we break down hereditary Alzheimer's disease, 
Uh, about 50 to 60 percent of it is caused by mutations in the PZN1 gene. 10 to 15 percent is caused by mutations in the APP gene, and about 5 percent or less is called by caused by mutations in the PZN2 gene. And then y'all see there, about 25 percent of early onset hereditary Alzheimer's remains a mystery. We do genetic testing, and we cannot find the gene mutation. So there's our first big, big gap for what, what can we do with these families? Why can't we solve their mystery? There's more. So three different genes causing one condition, um, PZN1, PZN2, and APP. These are all three genes that play a role in the breakdown of a protein called amyloid precursor protein. And um, if you guys know a little bit about Alzheimer's disease, you may have heard about these amyloid plaques that develop in the brain. And I don't have pictures. I'm not going to talk a lot about amyloid plaques and what develops in the brain. Um, but I will tell you that if you have a mutation on a gene that has a role in the breakdown of that protein, then basically that is going to cause more amyloid plaques. So that's kind of a vague description of what these three genes do and what that protein, that amyloid precursor protein does. Let's move on to the vast majority of Alzheimer's disease and that's late onset or average onset Alzheimer's disease. This is what 98% of people that have Alzheimer's have this. Um, onset is typically after age 65 and this we can see we can observe familial patterns of average onset Alzheimer's but the vast majority is sporadic okay meaning it's not a familial situation or a hereditary situation that we observe so what we see though is we're finding multiple genetic risk factors so we do all this genetic research on the entire human genome, and we're finding all kinds of little hits throughout the human genome that may actually modify our risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And when I say modify, I mean, I mean that some genetic alterations may slightly elevate our risk. Other genetic alterations may slightly decrease our risk for Alzheimer's. Um, what's interesting is this is very heavily studied and examined, and we're not making a lot of progress. Um, I, we haven't made a lot of progress over the last two decades, but I feel like just within the last year or two, we've kind of hit this um, new fast pace at making new discoveries for the vast majority of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so... Um, once again, I have to throw this picture up because I really like it. Um, how the vast majority of, of what happens to us as we age um, is really the result of genes, individual choices, and environment. So, so most of the things that occur to us in life, whether it's health-wise, whether it's um, dementia or Alzheimer's or cancer or heart disease, is the result of this combination of complex events. And um, it's the same with, with Alzheimer's. So let's break that down a little bit further. So risk factors in general, not just genetic risk factors, but all risk factors. And some of these you, you all are all going to be familiar with. Uh, age, age alone, the prevalence doubles with about every decade after age 60. Um, so there's some numbers there for you. If you're over 60, about 5%. This is pre these are prevalence numbers. Um, over age 75, about 10%. Over age 85, about 20%. And prevalence means um, the occurrence. How many people have Alzheimer's at this, at this moment, at this age? So another risk factor, of course, while we're here today, is family history. The risk is higher for relatives of affected individuals. So if you have a relative with Alzheimer's, your risk 
is higher than someone who doesn't have a relative with Alzheimer's. And I'll get some specific numbers for you in just a minute. Gender. Alzheimer's is more common in females. This is something that we're studying closely and we're trying to figure out why and you know we're always having to try to make some connection to hormones. And so it's possible that um, there could be an estrogen factor that's actually um, impacting why females are more likely to develop Alzheimer's. And then what about some life exposure factors? Head trauma, high cholesterol, and lack of mental stimulation are all um, lifestyle factors or events that can impact the risk. So what about genetics? Let's talk about these modifiers. I like the word modifier, and it's such a, it's kind of a trendy word to use now if you're in genetics, um, because we're finding things that just slightly change or modify our risk. And like I said, some that may increase our risk and some that may decrease or actually have a protective or helpful effect on our um, developing certain diseases or conditions. So um, modifier or, um, yeah, genetic modifiers influence the risk but don't guarantee a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So let's start with the APOE gene, APOE, which stands for apolipoprotein E. And this is something that we've known about for a while. Some of you in the room may have heard of it before. Um, but the APOE, this is a gene that makes a protein. All genes make proteins, by the way. That's how we function. That's how we do what we do. Every gene pretty much makes a protein, and it's the protein that carries out whatever task needs to be carried out to make us living human beings walking around on this planet. So the APO gene makes a protein that combines with fats in the body to form lipoproteins. So this is all starting to sound like cholesterol stuff and heart attack and stroke stuff when you start talking about lipoproteins. Um, and so that'll kind of start to pop up a little bit more the more we talk. So the, I'm gonna say it again, the APOE gene makes a protein that combines with fats in the body to form lipoproteins. So the APOE protein is a major component of very low density lipoproteins. And you may have heard about VLDLs at your doctor's office when they're drawing blood and talking about your cholesterol and the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol. So that APOE gene that we're connecting with Alzheimer's disease is also connected to talking about those VLDLs or the good, um, it's connected to good cholesterol. So VLDA, VLDLs remove excess cholesterol from the body and then carry it to the liver for processing. So that APOE gene is pretty fascinating and pretty important. So let's talk about specifically APOE4. Now, E4, so there's the APOE gene, and then there's different versions of a gene. So I'll have a different version than my neighbor simply because that's what I inherited from my parents. And um, that one of the versions of the APO gene is the APOE4 gene. And this is the one that gets all the attention for being associated with an increased risk for Alzheimer's. So the mechanism of this is not totally understood, but people who have the E4 version of this gene, um, that, that version is associated with increased amyloid plaques in the brain. So there's a connection that we've made. And again, remember that amyloid plaques, we can kind of connect to cholesterol and lipoproteins as well as the E4 allele. So amyloid plaques lead to the death of neurons and progressive signs of Alzheimer's disease. It appears to shift, the APOE4 allele or, or version of the gene appears to shift age onset just a little bit earlier. So it's not necessarily that if you have an APOE4 gene, it's not necessarily that we're suddenly seeing you develop early onset Alzheimer's, but you may develop it 
a little bit younger um, compared to the, those folks who do not carry that version of that allele. But not all people with APOE4 develop Alzheimer's because again, it's a modifier. It's not a guarantee that these folks with this particular version are going to develop Alzheimer's disease. So there's different versions, like I said, there's APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. Um, I won't go much into this other than to say um, some people think that the E3 version of this allele is totally neutral. They think it doesn't really harm anybody, doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't um, prevent or cause Alzheimer's. My very next slide, I'm going to show you that um, another study kind of contradicts that, which is often the case in medicine. APOE2 may protect against Alzheimer's disease. We're not totally sure, but we think that there's a good chance that it appears it may have a protective effect. Uh, interestingly, when somebody, you know, we have two copies of every gene. We get one copy from mom and one copy from dad. So if somebody inherits two versions of the E2, they actually have a genetic condition called hyperlipid, no, hyperlipoproteinemia. And um, they're at extreme risks for um, uh, extremely high cholesterol and all that comes with it, all the problems that come with it. And then one copy of the E2 also seems to increase the risk for macular degeneration. Look at the E4 stats. 25 to 30 percent of the general population, so 30 percent, 25 to 30 percent of us in this room have one E4 copy. When something is this prevalent or common in the general population, then we know it can't have a huge effect on um, our risk alone. It can't have a huge risk, a huge effect alone by itself. So it's working with and against other things um, to, to alter our, ri our risk because it's so common. And then if you look at people that have Alzheimer's disease, 40% of them have one copy of this. Also, E4 increases the risk for atherosclerosis and therefore heart attack and stroke. So this, we don't, I'm not going to harp on it a lot, but I am going to show you, just point out, and you don't have to squint to look at it, I'll tell you, that if you look at this, this is something that looks at people who have Alzheimer's disease and their genes, okay? So these people already have it. And if you look at people who already have it, the number of, the percentage of people who have two E4s, so they got two of that um, Alzheimer-associated modifier, only about 13% of them have two copies. Um, if you look at those who have Alzheimer's disease and a family history, about 19% of them have two E4s. And so that's really the only point I wanted to make from that chart. So what if we have two copies of the E4 version? 30% lifetime risk for Alzheimer's disease. That's kind of the number that we shake out from all that data. 30% risk for Alzheimer's if you get two copies, one from mom and one from dad, of the E4 allele or e E4 version of the gene. Females, let's break it down a little bit more. Females who have two copies of the E4 have a higher chance, 45%. And then males have about a 25% chance of developing Alzheimer's by age 73. Another gene, this is just um, something that's popped up in the literature last year. New um, alteration that seems to significantly impact the risk for Alzheimer's disease, the TRIM2 gene, and that P.R47H, that's just the name of the genetic mutation. But the interesting thing about this is that it's rare in the general population. And when you start seeing things that are rare in the general population, then it seems to have um, a more promising long-term effect on, I think this may really be an alteration that may really have an impact on Alzheimer's disease. So when you look at frequency data, it can kind of support 
um, the theory that it has an impact on Alzheimer's disease. So trim two, something to just kind of keep in your mind um, for the next couple years and see if we have more stuff to shake out about it. Genome-wide studies, this is what has kind of changed our uh, direction and our momentum for Alzheimer's research. Genome-wide studies means we take your DNA and we look at your entire set of DNA. Every gene that you have, um, we can observe it now in a more cost-effective manner, in a more time-efficient manner, and because of those abilities, um, what we're able to discover with complex disease like Alzheimer's disease are, um, it's just through the roof now, what we'll be able to connect and um, the discoveries that we'll be able to make. So this has just become, like I said, cost effective in the last, I would say, three years. And so now some good data is really going to come in. Because now we can look at a lot of people's DNA much cheaper and much, quick, much quicker than before. So what about genetic testing for Alzheimer's disease? Well, right now, if you think about it, we consider it as predictive testing because we know how to work up someone who comes to the doctor because they have symptoms of dementia or symptoms of Alzheimer's. We're able to do that and diagnose them. We're talking about testing in the predictive setting where someone is maybe younger and is worried that they may develop Alzheimer's and they're that person that wants to know. You know, not everybody wants to know. Um, some people want to know because they want to prepare. Um, and they, it it's, it's just varies really from personality type to personality type. But let's talk about it. So predictive testing is clinically available, meaning you can go see a specialist and have a genetic test, have a blood test for that 2% of early onset. So small percentage of people that we actually, um, that experts actually recommend going in, seeing the doctor, having the genetic test. In that situation, we'd rather start by testing a relative who has Alzheimer's disease because that's the person to find the gene in. And then if we find it in that person, then we're able to test their offspring or their relatives to see if they have inherited it, okay? <laughs> um, so a very small piece of the pie actually are appropriate for predictive testing. What about APOE4 testing or TRIM2 testing? What about that 98% where we want to look at modifiers? Um, the truth is, right now, we feel like that is most appropriate in the clinical, in, in the setting of clinical trials or research. Um, having said that, there are actually panel tests that are available now where somebody can go get a test or spit in a tube and then they get this result, this report back that says, these are your risks for cancer, heart disease. Alzheimer's, cleft lip and palate, things like that. There's tests that are big panel tests now that will give you this type of information. But um, our organizations, our experts, these teams that come together and make their opinion about things, um, for the most part feel that testing for these modifier genes like APO, E4, or TRIM2 um, is not something that is ready for mainstream general population, test anybody that ever, and everybody that wants to be tested. Because number one, we don't know for, cer for certain what your risk is if you have one of these modifiers or if you have two of these modifiers. So we're not able to give you the best, most accurate information. And then we also don't know how you'll interpret it and act upon it. And so for that reason, Studies like that we like to keep in the research umbrella. Um, does anybody know why I have the jar of peanut butter up there? Anyone? Anyone? Has anybody heard about peanut butter <laughs> testing in Alzheimer's? So this really cool study, so here's, let me wake everybody up now that we're kind of through all the hard genetics. Um, the University of Florida published 
in October of 2013 this really neat study where um, you can use peanut butter to screen for Alzheimer's disease. And this is screening for the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. And y'all, I think it's a decent study, okay? Um, I do. And the point that they make is this is great for physicians' offices who maybe don't have the quick and easy access to the big, huge academic centers. So it's a uh, re somewhat reliable, easy way to screen people. So when the University of Florida published this study, guess who ran with it? Dr. Oz. So, <laughs> right, so doc, now he has shared with the world that you can test yourself for Alzheimer's with peanut butter. You gotta take all that with a grain of salt. Um, I think it's fascinating. The theory behind it is that the early stages of Alzheimer's disease first affect the first cranial nerve in your forebrain. And so what the, I'm going to tell you what the University of Florida did. I'm not going to tell you what you need to do at home because I don't want to <laughs> condone this. Um, but you can Google it. Um, blindfolded individuals who seemed to possibly be in the early stages of dementia. They were blindfolded, their mouths were closed, and um, the researchers took a ruler and a little bit of peanut butter, about a tablespoon of peanut butter, and with time, with each breath, they would move the peanut butter one centimeter closer. And one nostril, you do it with one nostril, and then you do it with the other nostril. And what they identified is that the left nostril, okay, when it's the left nostril that's doing the breathing, so when you're covering with the right, um, the left side became impaired. So that means that the peanut butter was closer to the nose when the patient could smell it compared to the right side. So the right side, they smelled it when it was far away left side it had to be brought in closer and that's an indication that the first cranial nerve is starting to not work as well which may lead to Alzheimer's and what they found is they compared this to other forms of dementia and to people that had no dementia and people that had other kinds of dementia it may have been the other side that was faulty or there may have been no faulty smelling but it, it seemed to correlate with Alzheimer's, the left side being faulty. Um, so, of course, now Dr. Oz is telling everybody to go sniff peanut butter. <laughs> but I don't trust myself to do it at home. I'd scare myself to death, and then I'd go to the doctor, and I will have done it wrong. So that's why I wouldn't. That's why I don't condone doing it yourself at home. But I think it's, it's, um, it's a nice thing to know that that's an inexpensive way maybe for other doctor's offices to use it as part of the workup for this. Um, so that's why I put peanut butter up there. So, okay, so who's appropriate for genetic testing? People that have family histories of the early onset form of Alzheimer's disease. APOE genotyping or testing for those APOE alleles, um, it's just not a sensitive enough test or a specific enough test to use in the general population or, or even in the population that comes in and says, well, I have one relative with Alzheimer's disease. I want to know my AP APOE genotype. I don't personally recommend it, but that doesn't mean that there aren't doctors out there doing it. Um, kind of the general genetics consensus, though, is that we're, it's just we're not there yet. Um, the reason why it's good to do that type of test, though, in the research setting is we can follow those people and say, okay, what makes that process of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive um, problems begin? And how do these risk factors and modifier genes interact with one another? So if we're looking at females who maybe took estrogens until they were 75 years old and they also have a modifier, but then they don't develop Alzheimer's, what's going on that that's something's favorable, happening favorably for them? 
So that's why it's, it's most appropriate in 2014 that we do these, this modifier type genetic testing and research. Um, so what are my, my, my chances for Alzheimer's disease? The general population risk is somewhere around 10 to 12 percent. And if you have a first degree relative, now a first degree relative means mother or father, sibling, sister, brother, or child, which most people aren't going to have a child and not be affected, but parent or sibling, first degree relative, then the, the risk jumps to about 20 to 25 percent risk that you will develop Alzheimer's disease. What happens when you get further than that? What if my mother and my grandmother developed Alzheimer's? Then that, that risk bumps up to about 30 to 35 percent. Um, anybody need to know more than two? <laughs> about 40 percent, once you get three and up, we don't, we don't really get much more specific than if there's three or more relatives. It's approaching 40 percent. But it's like one side of the family that's just under the mom, you know, like aunt, aunt, uncle, aunt on one side. Got it. You're, that's going to get more into the 30 to 35 percent range. So if we're talking mom, he said, what are, we, what are we talking, what if we're talking about mom, but then aunts and uncles? So it's going to fall into that 30 to 35 percent range. Did you say if both sides of the family, if mom and dad both had it? You know, I didn't find good data on both, on both, and I think that's, that's, mm. I, it's hard for me to be to say with confidence it's going to get much out of twenty five percent. Truthfully, does what we eat have anything have any effect on Alzheimer's? <laughs> Based on what we are looking at today and talking to people about today, I don't have any knowledge of guiding your nutrition based on it. In other words, you're saying GMOs have no effect on it. Not to my knowledge. But I'm not, I'm not an expert on nutrition and its impact on it. Does the antitrypsin... How about your immune system? I don't know. I think GMOs are fascinating, but... Okay. Has anybody done any studies on the antitrypsin protein deficiency in Alzheimer's disease? <coughs> uh, repeat the question. Oh, okay. <coughs> antitrypsin deficiency... Protein. Um, so there's a condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It's a hereditary thing and looking at it in Alzheimer's. And today I don't, mm -mm, I don't know of any, any connection with Alzheimer's and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Yes? Good point. And, and there are so many dementia conditions and so many people that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I'll talk about that. Yep. You, okay, because I think um, you know, that's, that's something that has to be sorted out. So let me talk about that. What she's alluding to is um, when you think about family history and you get Back, further back in generations, you don't really know, and this happens in my in my cancer world a lot, a lot too. You just don't know what your relatives had. Um, dementia is thrown around a lot with further or previous generations, um, but you don't know that it was Alzheimer's or something else. I know. Oh, that's better. That's better. Um, and so, I in genetics we always take the the path of only cons really only if we don't know it's Alzheimer's we can't let it consume us. I guess that's the best way. So I won't take into account 
if I have a patient who says, I'm not sure, but Mima had this, and I just, I'm not sure what it was. I'm not going to take it to the bank. I'm not going to use it and run with it. And I tend to be an overly cautious genetics person. So, um, so when you have family histories of, if you have family histories of folks who you're just not sure what it was, and maybe they, they didn't go to the doctor, and they were out in the country, and you don't know what they had, and they just died in their bed, but, but they seem like maybe they had some dementia, um, I think kind of let it rest and don't feel like it's dooming you. I think more than anything, I hope this is more reassuring to you all that having a parent or a grandparent or even having two previous generations affected with Alzheimer's disease does not mean that you're going to develop it and it doesn't mean that you're more likely to develop it because most of the numbers I'm throwing out are 25, 30 percent but then if you had several then max I would say about a 40 percent risk if your relatives had more average onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so more than anything, I want to be reassuring. I don't want to paint a rosy, rosy picture, but I want to be reassuring that your risk is probably lower than you think it is. Um, but also, we've heard all these things that we can do to lower the risk, and there's, there's truth to that. There really is truth to keeping your mind stimulated, keeping your body healthy, um, and just being overall um, kind of a well-rounded, healthy individual. Yes, ma'am. How do you know the difference between plain old forgetfulness and Alzheimer's? So this does start to get out of my, out of my um, scope of expertise. So y'all heard, I'm just a genetics person. I just know about the code. <laughs> um, I don't know so much about the workup and diagnosis, and I don't know so much about you know, what's that point where you say, ah, okay, it's time to go to the doctor and get checked. But you know, you start with going to your primary care doctor and you follow your gut and you go to your doctor and then you take it from there. And I know you can probably speak to that more. Yes, ma'am. We, we speak of dementia and, and Alzheimer's kind of interchangeably. Are we, are we talking about genetics just for Alzheimer's? Yes, ma'am. So, so I'm just talking about Alzheimer's disease today. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Have there studies been done to know if you've had uh, chemotherapy, which you know washes the brain too? Is there anything related to that that could cause that? So any impact on chemotherapy and amyloid plaques, and I do not, I'm not aware of there being correlations, okay. either positive or negative. Okay. The other question I have is you refer to the cost of genetic art. Could you give us a, a kind of a basic cost? Sure, so costs of genetic testing. In general, if someone goes through genetic testing um, today, most genetic tests run about $1,000 a gene. So if you're going to have three genes examined, like in the case of early onset hereditary Alzheimer's disease where there's three genes, usually about $2,500 to $3,000 for genes like that. Typically, if a genetic test is indicated, in other words, if you have a family history of a genetic condition and your doctor says genetic testing is warranted, your insurance will most likely cover it. And it's okay to have genetic testing. Um, it's illegal for, I'm glad this came up, it's illegal for anyone to discriminate um, based on a genetic test result. So it's illegal at the state level and the federal level. You're protected if you have a genetic mutation of any kind, any kind, whether it's Alzheimer's or cancer or cystic fibrosis. It's illegal for you to be discriminated against based on a genetic mutation. It's still the same. So she said, she said a few years ago, I always heard or I've heard that you can only make the diagnosis at autopsy. Is that still true today? And it is. It actually is. What is the total number of genes we have? And do the males and females have the same number? Pretty much. We, um, about 
t we have about roughly 20,000 genes. <laughs> Okay. And some of some of the gene, some of our genome is called junk DNA, and that's exactly what it is. It's it's junk. We think it's junk. We don't really know. This is all you know. We're really at the dawn of all this. Um, but yeah, about twenty thousand. So there's still a lot to learn. So when we're able to do these genome-wide <laughs> studies, um, we have a lot to learn from them. Carla, may I say something? I'm yes. Asking to Donna in your question about. You know, as we age, and if they do want to scan our brain, you know, there is some appropriate changes that happen just as we get older. But, you know, it can, they can do a scan and it be really shrink much smaller than it should be appropriate at that age. So there are some changes that they can look at. It's not a diagnosis, but they can say that it's just not appropriate for that age. It would be a high suspicion that there might be something going on that's not appropriate and they won't they may not tag it but it would lend more toward a diagnosis uh, you know it's still they will still probably say we cannot give a definitive diagnosis but it would put more in the category probably than leaning toward diagnosis uh, you know dementia is more of a symptom alzheimer's is a diagnosis dementia can be due uh, because of many other diseases Dementia is just meaning that we're having some memory issues due to a lot of diseases. But Alzheimer's is truly a diagnosis. But, you know, because of scans, we can see if it's age appropriate or not. And so, uh, you know, it would give us a real good clue that maybe that, that, you know, grandmother is, you know, maybe leaning more toward that diagnosis. Well, Parkinson's disease is what That's right. That's right. 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 Parkinson's disease is another version of dementia. So, a lot of great questions, okay? Okay, let's give Carla a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And I I'm, feel so honored to be here today at Dawson Baptist Church. This church has been a good family um, to Alzheimer's of Central Alabama, and we've got a program coming up on June 23rd that'll be right back here in this space and I'll end my talk today with some more information about that but we have a lot of our experts from UAB that are going to participate the afternoon session of that's a research symposium one of the, our speakers is actually going to talk on the differential diagnosis of Alzheimer's and of, of dementia and that is helping us understand what's Alzheimer's disease what strokes What's frontal temporal lobe dementia? You know, what happens when somebody has Parkinson's and has dementia? So some of those questions that you've answered today will be answered then. then. So I hope you'll be able to come back and join us. Yeah, am I just... Ah, well, I've got a, I've got a title there I did not know I had. Okay. Um, every 67 seconds, someone in America develops dementia. And we started quoting this statistic um, about four or five years ago, and at that time that we would say every, it's every 72 seconds. So you see, as time goes forward, because our baby boomers are all reaching the age of 65 at an alarming rate, over 10,000 of us every day are reaching our 65th birthday, we're seeing more and more dementia. And that's why I think programs like this are so important, because so many of us have questions and an interest in this area. There are over um, 5 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease. There's a growing number of young patients, um, 200,000 nationwide. And we know that, again, as time goes forward, we'll see more and more patients um, with Alzheimer's. Um, nearly half of us have a personal connection to Alzheimer's disease. You know, listening to someone talk about genetics is particularly scary for someone like me. I've had three family members with Alzheimer's disease. I've had it on both sides of my family. Um, my mother was 64 when she died. She didn't die from Alzheimer's disease, but she was certainly in the early stages. And we were really seeing changes that seemed to be happening very rapidly. So um, I certainly have that connection, and it is what drives my work, and it is what makes me so passionate about this illness. Um, you know, nearly all of us worry about our memory when we forget something. I forgot something very important today. On my way over here, I was going to bring you all some handouts from Alzheimer's of Central Alabama, some of our, our recent newsletters, and I walked out the door with, without them. But... I have to say we've got a big fundraiser Saturday night, so that's my excuse. Um, 
always good to have an excuse when you forget something. I don't know if y'all are that way, but I certainly am. You know, this is Mother's Day weekend, and women are at the epicenter of Alzheimer's disease, and we, we, we have an unbalanced burden. Um, you know, our, our um, more than, uh, we have a great risk of being the ones who are caregivers. Um, there's, there's two and a half women providing care for every man that's providing care. Um, our lifetime risk at age 65 is one in six for a woman. It's one in 11 for a man. A woman in their 60s is twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease as they are breast cancer. So we really are at, at great risk. Um, I was so pleased that, that Debbie told you a little bit about what Alzheimer's of Central Alabama does. I want to tell you all we're a local organization that provides local services. And to me, that's very important. Everything that we do, the money that we raise, stays here in Birmingham and in Alabama and across Central Alabama to provide services and education and support research. We have funded um, uh, 20 research grants since 2001. 18 of those have been at UAB, one at Auburn, um, and one at, at Tuscaloosa. Uh, four of the researchers that we have um, funded will be here at our program on June 23rd um, to help us understand more about how uh, the research at UA UAB fits into the larger picture and where we're headed really with Alzheimer's disease and what we can expect in the future. Now the services that we provide are varied and I always say you know Alzheimer's disease goes by stages and we're going to talk a little bit about that even though that's not what Debbie asked me to talk about here today. I can't ever get away without just giving some basics about Alzheimer's. To me we have a program that fits every stage in the disease. So we provide, um, and they're actually listed backwards going up, care track bracelets that are for patients who wander, patients who at, at the early um, stages of the disease are at great risk for wandering. We're going to talk about that risk later. Um, respite care and adult daycare are very important because it provides the appropriate stimulation for patients, although it's beyond the means of many families to afford this level of care. It is the best bargain out there. You know, to have someone that goes to an adult daycare where they have stimulation, engagement, um, is so important in helping them keep their nights and days um, straight, as we all know is important, as well as the benefits for the caregiver. And the final program that we do that's really important is providing continence care. And we talk about, a lot about research and how research provides hope. If you can't afford a clean diaper for your mother, you do not live with very much hope. And we provide continence products that are delivered to the, um, the doors of some of our neediest families throughout central Alabama. So I'm really proud of the overall scope of things that Alzheimer's of Central Alabama is able to do. For being a small organization in, in a small state, we do a lot to help our citizenry. Now, um, I always think that you know, our first line of defense, the first thing we've really got to think about with Alzheimer's disease is education. It's really important to learn as you go through this disease because not everything about how you care for an Alzheimer patient, how you talk to an Alzheimer patient, and how you communicate with them is, is, comes to us naturally. You know, some people get it earlier. Some people really have to be boinked over the head with it. I have seen so many people in a support group and I can almost see a light bulb go off over their head when they finally begin to learn and use some of the, the communication techniques that we're going to talk about today. But communication is a real problem. Now, I, I like this, this quote. You know, the problem with communication is the illusion that it's been achieved. And, and I think that sometimes we're talking and people are hearing a completely different message. And our Alzheimer patients are no different. And the changes that happen in the brain really impact their ability to hear what we're saying, to comprehend what we're saying, as well as their overall increase in fear, their unsureness of the world around them. And so we have to begin to learn that our job is the rescuer. That's what we are for somebody who has Alzheimer's disease. We have a great handout. Of course, I don't have it here for you today. Y'all are going to have to call me or seek me out online to get it. But, you know, it says once you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, your behavior's forgiven 100% of the time. 
Now that's a really hard pill for the rest of us to swallow if we have to forgive our Alzheimer patients 100% of the time. Because literally sometimes I do think they're out to get your goat. I think sometimes they are very, very good and still skillful at pushing all of our buttons. But it's important to understand we're the rescuer now. That's what we do. That's our role, our primary role in communication. You know, um, I like this. Our universal dilemma when faced with Alzheimer's disease or dementia is I can't ignore it and I can't fix it. You know, I think that just sums up so much of the place where we all start with this disease. Something's going on, something's going on. I can't seem to do anything to make it right, but I can't ignore it anymore. A lot of us do ignore it. In fact, some of our family members, and y'all may have some of those in your, in your family, who are real good at ignoring the problem. Oh, I don't think there's anything really wrong. But when you're at the heart of things, when you're in someone's home, when you're talking to them on a daily basis, when you look in their medicine cabinet, when you look in their refrigerator, when you look in their checkbook, there are signs there that often you cannot ignore. Someone said, you know, what's the difference? When do you know it's memory problems and when do you know it's something more? It's when it is beginning to impact someone's ability to function independently. You know, that's when you need to talk to a physician. That's when memory loss is a problem. I, I worked with a, a, a lady who, um, worked well into her 80s. She was so beautiful and so wonderful. Um, but early in working with her at the, in the break room, um, I opened up the refrigerator and somebody's keys were in there. And so I went back and I said, somebody's keys are in the refrigerator. And she said, of course, I've got leftovers from my lunch. That's the only way I'll remember to take my leftovers home. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a memory problem, but she's still functioning just great. And so as long as you're able to compensate, I think you're doing just fine. <laughs> now, you know, when we get back to talking about Alzheimer's, I, you know, I hate to bring up just the obvious worst aspects of Alzheimer's disease because we're not here to bring caregivers down. We're here really in this place and invited here by, by Debbie Moss and her ministry to lift ourselves up. But sometimes when we try to lift ourselves up, we have to start from the low point, and that is understanding this is hard. It is hard from start to finish when you begin to notice changes in a loved one. And it's really so important for caregivers to take care of themselves. Um, a support group is a great tool for that in helping you learn to take care of yourself, um, sharing with anyone what you're going through. But it's important that you th begin to safeguard your mental health, your spiritual health, your physical health. All of those things are so important for you to be able to go the distance. Alzheimer's disease is a long disease. It's not short. And that makes it all that much more difficult. From average, from diagnosis to death, is about eight to 10 years, although we have seen families whose loved ones have lived much longer, almost as long as 20 years. So you know, as a caregiver, you've got to begin to pace yourself. You know, a lot of caregivers experience depression. This is a common theme in my support group where somebody will, will be listening to someone new and they'll feel comfortable in saying, well, you know, I had to talk to my doctor about that and I had to get on um, a prescription for that. And I think it's something that we have to acknowledge. And I've got to say, for us who are leaning towards feeling like or recognizing in ourselves that we're feeling depressed, depression is a toxic on the brain. You know, treat depression in your loved one with Alzheimer's disease and treat depression in yourself because you don't want there to be any doubt that you're not doing all that you can to preserve the integrity of your brain health. You know, a lot of 70% uh, of caregivers consider frustration to be the biggest emotion that they feel. You know, there's a lot of sadness. There's also a lot of love. I think it's important to acknowledge that most caregiver studies find that um, a lot of caregivers will report that they found inner strengths that they didn't know they had. I think that's a great outcome. I think that's the best outcome we can hope. You've got to get better, not bitter, because that's what this is all about, and, and learning how to make the most of this situation in your life. Now, we know that a lot of caregivers say they don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I've had, just here in the recent past, two of my caregivers who are here with the second generation of patients. You know, they've been with me went through their mother's diagnosis, and now they're with me because they have a spouse. And, you know, that's, that's a lot. 
That's when it's really tough to get better, not bitter. Now, um, this, this quote is, is one of my favorites. I've used it for many years. Albert Cole's wife, Virginia, had Alzheimer's disease for 17 years. He was the director of Shepherd Centers of America. He continued to travel with Virginia. His demeanor towards her, maybe her demeanor, I don't know, but it mixed into a beautiful relationship that continued to thrive throughout Alzheimer's disease. She wasn't always easy to care for, but when she wasn't, he found a way to manage it. He came to Birmingham years ago and his talk was titled, The Shift from Cure to Care. And I still go back to that because I think it's important for us all to think about. The shift from cure to care was an important decision for us because I realized my task was to manage life while Virginia's task was to enjoy it. When we're called to care for someone who is improving, we get to feel really good about everything that we do. If you're seeing day by day improvement in the one that you're caring for, it feels great. But with Alzheimer's disease, well, sometimes you see ups and downs and you don't know, is this a good day or a bad day? But overall, when you're caring for someone who de continues to decline besides, besides your best efforts, that's hard. So that's what we have to begin to think about. We're providing care, we're not providing cure. And so that's an important distinction for us to make. Um, this is Ruby. Ruby's almost become like a poster child for Alzheimer's of Central Alabama. Her daughter attends my support group. Uh, Ruby goes to a daycare on an ACA scholarship. And this is Ruby from a few years ago, and I'm gonna end my talk with showing you a, a more recent picture of Ruby. But her daughter told me, um, some days I think I can't do this anymore. And today is one of those days. I'm tired, I have to work all day, and I can hardly leave mother in the other room now, much less get out of the house with her in tow. It's been three short, long years. And it's taken a toll on both of us, but we'll continue on. Some days she doesn't want to leave the adult daycare center. We call it going to school. The staff and her friends are just the best, and she never complains about getting up and ready to go. One of the things that Joanne has learned is that one of the hardest with our Alzheimer patients, and that is routine works best. Keeping her in that routine, getting up and going every day, getting up and getting dressed at the same time, those are the things that help Ruby function at her very best. Um, this is a, a, a list of things that came out of a support group for patients. Now we tried this here in the Birmingham area some years ago and I think it's a great idea if we could ever pull together enough early stage patients who understood their diagnosis and wanted to deal with it. But we've been continually challenged to make that work. But I think it's important to understand that there are Alzheimer patients who do know their diagnosis and those who can teach us what it's like to be a patient have a lot to offer us. And so when they talk about, you know, they wanna to continue to feel self-confident without realizing it, a lot of times we put our Alzheimer patients down. We do that. We don't realize it, but we do that. They wanna overcome feelings that people don't trust them. They need additional time to absorb what we're saying and some patients even understand if you just talk slower, if you just get their attention before you speak, they could understand and respond better. I think this is really important um, for our patients. Now, these are pictures of an Alzheimer's brain and a disease brain. These are, these are Alabama-grown brains. These are from the Department of Mental Health um, and Dr. Richard Powers who at one point ran a program for the Department of Mental Health called the Dementia Education Training Program. They actually have a series of books that show some of these pictures of Alzheimer's brains versus healthy brains. And a picture's really worth a thousand words because when you look at an Alzheimer patient and they still look healthy and robust, that's when we forget that their behavior is the result of a disease process. We're the ones in the relationship that have to realize that and get what that means because they can't tell us, they can't ask for our help. We have to begin to understand it's caused by a disease. Now, um, when we talk about that progressive loss of brain tissue, this will show some brain scans over time. 
for Alzheimer's disease, so you can see normal. In patients with mild cognitive impairment, those are patients who are beginning to have memory loss. We're not sure what that's caused. Some people have mild cognitive impairment and don't go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. However, many and most do. And then you can see the changes in the Alzheimer patient. Our early stage patients need supervision, okay? Now to me, one of the best ways to think about Alzheimer's disease is that um, patients lose skill in the reverse order that children develop them in, okay? So what that means is your most complex skills, the thing that we teach our children last, are actually the first things that Alzheimer patients begin to lose. One of the things that's really key is that, um, you know, our young adults, our young people, the last thing that is hardwired in your brain is actually judgment. That's the last skill that's hardwired in your brain, really not until, in most patients, their early 20s. And that's why our young people continue to need so much guidance from everybody wiser that's around them, even when they may think that they're adults. I can tell you because I have a 21-year-old. Um, but for our Alzheimer patients, so when we think about the problems that they begin to have, you know, it's very insidious and it's very gradual. And of course it's memory loss, but we know for our Alzheimer patients what they lose is the ability to store and process new information. The things that are happening right now, those are the things that they're losing. Distant memories may still be clear. Distant memories are what they still have. Distant memories are stored and processed in the brain in a different way than those recent memories are. Those recent memories are not formulated. They just drop right off. So they may forget that they've taken their medication. They may forget where they've put something or that they've left something on the stove because of that memory loss. Word finding difficulties um, we can see with our Alzheimer patients because we'll talk about the communication changes and what, how that really impacts patients. Difficulty with routine tasks, whether or not that's something like going to the grocery store, buying the proper ingredients and bringing them home, and being able to prepare a meal and getting it on the table. That's really very common and every day for lots of us, but that's a really complex set of skills that dementia patients begin to lose because they have difficulty with things that take multiple steps. There's so many ways to get lost and forget what you're doing, forget your place, forget your, where your bookmark is, so to speak, when you're doing something as complex as getting a meal on the table. Um, personality changes, you know, I see this a lot with my caregivers and support groups. You know, we can either see what I consider a personality exaggeration. It's hard to see where, I hate to say it, somebody maybe their cantankerous personality ends and a disease process begins. Maybe they've always been a little bit hard to be around, you know, and now that they have Alzheimer's disease, they're even much worse. I've had some caregivers, though, whose patients actually change. They may have been always a loving, kind person, and they have a more angry or more upset course of Alzheimer's disease. So personality changes as well as personality ex exaggerations. And of course, again, we're going to talk about getting lost. So these four A's of Alzheimer's disease, these are medical terms important for us to understand when we think about how this impacts a person with dementia. We've talked about that memory loss. Difficulties with body movements, the things that we ought to be able to do on automatic pilot, the things that we do without thinking of them. Um, you know, if you think about the most complex skills of getting dressed, you know, when you talk about what puts, um, what causes families to reach out and begin to need help, either through an adult daycare or to bring someone into the home, or even to place a loved one in an assisted living facility in a nursing home, it's usually the functional changes. It's not the memory loss, because a lot of times we can compensate for that. It's these changes in their ability to do their self-care skills. So your most complex self-care skills are going to be the ones that you lose first. So you might have an Alzheimer patient who can still dress, but they may not dress appropriately. You know, they may dress in a, in a heavy coat on a day like today. Um, they may not get the sequence of their clothes on properly. I had someone who said, with all these storms, um, her, her, she was living with her mother, and she came home from work, and her mother was in the front yard negotiating getting some trees 
um, dam damaged tree limbs up, and her mother was talking to this gentleman about um, getting a quote and had her bra on the outside of her shirt. Well, I'm sure he was giving her quite a fair quote, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> that would not be someone getting taken advantage of. <clears throat> So, you know, this is, this is what we're talking about, these problems with the most complex skills. So when we think about dressing, the most complex skills of dressing, just the mechanics of dressing, it's things like what? Tying your shoes, um, buckles, buttons, you know, the zippers, all of the things that we ought to instinctively be making easier for our Alzheimer patient is they have trouble dressing. You know, you're going to make their clothes easier for them. You're going to simplify their routine. Eating is another one. We don't come into this world knowing how to eat. And if it's a skill you learned, Alzheimer's disease can cause you to unlearn that skill. And so table manners may be the, the, the first thing that we notice that they're, they're, they're beginning to, to slack on. Knowing how to cut their meat and use a knife and fork. And so you begin to think about, you know, finger foods. You know, it's the same kind of way that you taught children how to become more independent in eating. You know, our Alzheimer patients are moving in the opposite direction of that. And then the inability to recognize things. You know, I think if you're an Alzheimer a, a caregiver um, and, you've, and you, your patient has gotten to that point, that's, that's a real watershed moment for you. I remember with my grandmother the first time she didn't recognize me because I truly thought, because I was the one closest, I was the one there most, I would be the one most remembered, and that did not necessarily hold to be the truth. Guess what? It was my brother that didn't even live in the state. Um, <laughs> but that's generally the way it is. So our Alzheimer patients begin to have problems um, recognizing familiar faces, and they can even have problems recognizing their own face in the mirror. Now, when we think about communication, I, I just have got a, you know, not that you can read any of this, but this is um, a story about an, one Alzheimer patient, one example of the worst tragedy that can happen. This is a story of a woman named Lula um, whose body was recovered after she had been missing for two days, just this January here in Birmingham. And I've talked to her family, and, you know, they, they didn't have a lot of good options. Um, they didn't have a lot of good options for care, mostly because they're of finances. And um, the daughter had to go to work, and she told her mother, you stay right here, and I'm going to be back in a few hours. When she got home, her mother was gone. You know, and I think it's a real tragedy when we do all that we can, and that's what happens. Um, but this is, this is, you know, the real tragedy that can happen with Alzheimer's disease. When we think about, I've communicated with my mom, I've said, Mom, don't leave the house. You know, it's really cold outside. That was January 24th. I don't know if y'all remember January 24th. We were right before that really horrible snowstorm. So it was a very, very cold day. Um, this is a picture of, of, of Paul and his wife, Mary. And um, Mary, when she began to have uh, noticed problems with her husband, was quick to call the Alzheimer's of Central Alabama office. And she got one of our care track bracelets. And she wrote us and she said, after receiving a diagnosis for Paul, the amount of stress has been overwhelming. We are both deaf and have been all of our lives. So we were used to living in a silent world. However, not being able to hear him leave the house has added stress. I could no longer leave his side, and nights were additionally difficult since that's when he would always wander. And now she wears the care track, he wears a care track bracelet, and she has more ease. And, you know, that's what's really important is we've got to have the tools. You know, we've got to be able to have the tools and the education to know best how to care for an Alzheimer patient. Um, these are some pictures taken from Mel York's adult daycare. Mel is here. His daycare is the South Highland Center and represents um, one of, of many great daycares that we have in our community, where, as I said, patients can really get the kind of care that they need, and, a and, a, and their, um, their, their caregiver can get the break that they deserve. Um, I like these pictures because um, one of the things that Mel does is some art therapy with his patients, and... Um, you know, sometimes we might look at someone who can't brush them, their, their teeth. 
who can't get themselves dressed, who can't fix themselves breakfast, and you might say, well, there's somebody that can't paint a picture. But that's not what we find. We find if you give them some individual instruction and you work with them, that actually they can. And this is what we call person-centered care. This is when you're really thinking about the individual, you're giving that individual the individual care and attention that they need. And that's what's so great about something like an adult daycare center. So our middle stage in the disease is the stage where patients need custodial care. And I can tell you from experience and from listening to my caregivers, this is the longest and most difficult stage in the disease. Custodial care, they've got to have somebody looking out for them 24 hours a day. You know, these are symptoms, or, or what we would call symptoms, repeated questions and actions, packing to go home, agitation, sleeplessness, refusing to take a bath. You know, if you don't know that that's a symptom of a disease, you would think that was just somebody being cantankerous, wouldn't you? You know, and that's, all, that's why we've got to begin to make the shift where we have to begin to become the rescuer. So what's most important, the cornerstone in communicating with our Alzheimer patient is this right here. You do not rationalize, you do not reason, you do not argue. Or if you do those things, you do them as infrequently as you can possibly help it. Because those strategies don't work. What's most important is trying to redirect our patient. When they get off on a tangent, we have to bring them back focus to a, something more positive. When they are saying something that's not right, it does no good to correct them. It only serves us well to try to redirect their activity. And that's what we really need to focus on. I like this from Mark Twain. He says, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. <laughs> and with our Alzheimer patients, that is exactly the case. So we're going to talk a little bit about learning the Alzheimer's language. And I want to tell you about um, Gloria. Gloria's husband attended my, my daycare. And he, um, I'm going to say, you know, he just may have not had the best temperament for being a caregiver, but there he was. He found himself as a caregiver, and that happens sometimes. So thank goodness he didn't keep Gloria at home with him all day, and he took Gloria to daycare. Um, Gloria had had a great career and had actually um, worked in, in radio and broadcast, and, and um, she had been very successful in her life, and didn't really do well as an Alzheimer patient because wherever she was, she still wanted to be the boss. She still wanted to be very involved. And so at the daycare center one time, um, she was in the supply closet, taking everything out, rearranging it, putting everything where no one could find it. And the daycare worker came over and said, what are you doing? You're making a huge mess. Well, the daycare director was there, and she said, well, Gloria, why don't you just come and sit in my office for a few minutes? And they sat in there for a few minutes, and, and the daycare director said, um, you don't like it when people tell you what to do, do you? And she, Gloria said, no, and I never have. <laughs> and that story has really stuck with me, because, you know, Gloria was doing something that she thought was very appropriate and very helpful. And rather than correct her, rather than cut her off, we have to find a way to redirect her and to make that activity more appropriate. Years ago, I was given a talk, and um, we had a break, and um, there were some ladies in the restroom where I was, and I was talking all this about how we redirect patients, and one of them in, in another stall was saying, um, well, all this sounds really good until you try it in the real world. And, and I get that. It's hard sometimes to learn this new way of letting the Alzheimer patient always be right, even when they're wrong. But the consequences of not doing that are even worse, because you wind up more frustrated, and your patient winds up more frustrated. It is literally the snowball that rolls down the hill. So when we learn the Alzheimer's language, we have to think about the same kinds of things that we would think about if we were taking care of a baby or a child, if there was a baby here in this room that got upset and started to cry, every one of us in this room would instinctively know the things to do to soothe that child. We would see if that baby was hungry, 
We would see if that baby was thirsty. We would see if that baby was wet and needed changing. We would think about, is it too cold in here? Maybe I need to wrap that baby up in a blanket. And a lot of times our Alzheimer patients are communicating with words these same kinds of things. I can't tell you the countless stories of times I've heard from caregivers who will say, my mother's behavior just got worse and worse over a couple of days. She was so belligerent. And come to find out, it's not a behavioral change. It's a physical change. She has something like a urinary tract infection. But it's not complaining with words verbally, but is showing us with behavior. So we have to learn to be detectives. And that's what learning the Alzheimer's language is about. It's about learning to be a detective and to think about, is this behavior something that there might be a root cause, a root underlying cause, something that I can do to make this person feel better? Now, a lot of times when we've got that baby that's crying and we've exhausted all those things that I listed, what do we fall back on with a baby? Do y'all know? Pacifier. Well, a pacifier, <laughs> certainly. That works in my book. But you know what we do with that baby? We stop whatever we're doing. We sit down in the rocking chair, and we pat that baby. We sing to that baby. We coo to that baby. We let that baby know that we are there for that baby. And we don't do that with our Alzheimer patients. A lot of us don't do it because we don't remember it needs to be done. A lot of us don't do it because we don't have time, because we are so busy just trying to change the sheets, or we're just so busy trying to fix the meal, we're just so busy trying to do this and that, that we don't remember that sometimes what they really need is someone just to sit down and hold their hand for a few minutes. And that is the most important thing about learning the Alzheimer's language. Now, the ABCs of ADLs, ADLs are like activities of daily living. Those are the things that all of us had to do to get here today. We all had to get up, we all had to use the bathroom, we all had to get ourselves dressed. You know, those are the important things about um, um, functioning independently. It's your ability to continue to perform those very basic activities of daily living. And as I said, your Alzheimer patient is impacted in so many different ways with their memory loss, their communication skill loss, their inability to remember to do the things and how to do things in sequence that they once knew, all of that being impacted. I had this caregiver, and I always tell her story. Her name was Annie. And um, Annie had been a, uh, a special education teacher. And those turned out to be some fabulous skills that she learned there that she used when her husband began to have Alzheimer's disease. Now, she's the one, and a lot of y'all have probably heard me tell this story, because as he developed Alzheimer's disease, um, he began to, to use some very inappropriate language. And Annie one time told our, our, our support group she was just glad the words he said most often were hell and damn, because at least those were biblical terms. <laughs> um, which is, about, which is about the only words that some of our Alzheimer patients say that I can repeat in a, sanct, you know, in, a, in, in a church because some of them are not using biblical terms. They're, they're, they're definitely anything but. But, you know, when, when Annie was in a wheelchair and um, when her husband uh, first began to have difficulty with being able to, to do for himself in, in the bathroom, um, Annie could kind of get her wheelchair outside of the bathroom door and, and tell him and encourage him to do things, and that worked for a while, but it became apparent that she was going to have to bring somebody in. They were already living in a retirement community, and the very first day they brought somebody in, um, Annie could tell it was not going well. It just was like oil and water, and her husband did not take to that. Now, this was the first time anyone had been in his bathroom invading his personal space. And he didn't understand and he didn't take too well to it. And as Annie could hear the frustration go when Annie was out there in that hallway, I'm sure just in a panic herself, and she said, if you'll tell him what you're going to do before you do it, he'll, he'll often comply. Well, I could see that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unbutton your shirt now. 
rather than just reaching up and starting to undress someone, give them a little bit of warning. So there, the scuffle continued, and then he said, you know, when he gets really upset, I sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> and the sitter said, I don't have time to sing to him. Well, he grabbed that woman's finger, and he bent it back, and he broke it. <laughs> well, you know, um, paramedics were called. He was hospitalized. His medications were adjusted. And he never got back to the place where he could move back in home with her. And he wound up having to go to a nursing home. And I have to say, he didn't need his medication suggested, did he? He needed someone to sing Amazing Grace to him. And that's what it takes to learn to communicate with an Alzheimer patient. It's these, these ABCs, these very, very simple things that aren't simple to us and don't always come to us when we're frustrated when an Alzheimer patient won't do what we need them to do. So we have to be really aware of what it's like from their perspective. You know, maybe the lights are too bright. Maybe it's too cold in the bathroom. Maybe they think we're trying to, to harm them when really what we're trying to do is get their clothes off. Be aware of how we come across. Giving them small step-by-step -step instructions is really important. I've heard a caregiver say, if I told my dad, come over here and sit down next to me, he would just stand there. But if I said, come here, he would walk towards me. If I said, sit down, he would sit down next to me. It takes a little bit more time, but it doesn't take more time if the end result is they do what you need them to do. If the end result is they remain calm and you remain calm, that's learning the Alzheimer's language. And of course, cool collected communication, because do you know, Alzheimer patients lose the ability to comprehend spoken words. So they may not understand what you're saying, even though you're talking a blue streak to them, but they can look at your face and your facial expressions. And if they're interpreting an angry face, a frustrated face, a hostile face, you're going to get that back in return. So you've always got to try to give out the behavior that you want back. If you want them to be calm, you've got to stay calm. If you want a, 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 an even tone in the house, keep an even tone in the house. So cool, calm, collected communication is really important. Now, um, these are three challenges. You know, this is, these, these are just three examples of things that you've got to think about and apply to all of the many little things that happen in your day with your Alzheimer patient. So the first one is repeated questions. I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. That's a really common one, uh, but it could be anything. Um, it, it's time to take my medicine. It's time to eat. You know, these things that can be very frustrating. That you may have just fed them, but they're still asking for a meal. So our worst response, you know, some of the things that I hear a lot of those new people around the table at the support group will report right here that they will do. You know, I've already told him a hundred times. <laughs> Well, if you've already told them a hundred times, clearly that is not working. <laughs> so it's time to try something else. And that's what's really important. So you have to think, if it doesn't work, what could I do that does work? And so the best response with our Alzheimer patients is the shortest, simplest answer. They don't need a lot of detail. You know, you don't need to say, We've already eaten. You know, we ate and you cleaned your plate and I've already cleaned it up and we're not having anything till breakfast. That's not a good dementia response. A better dementia response is, you know, it's a, we're going to eat in a while. Let's wash our hands. Let's get ready. Let's wash our hands. And while you're washing their hands, you just get on to another topic. You put some lotion on their hands. You lead them back to where you want them to sit and you sit down with them. You know, it's that form of distraction that works that we've really got to begin to incorporate. Risky behavior. Well, of course, the worst one is, is the driving, the leaving someone at home. You know, and, and those, many of us, 
are ignoring this problem. You know, when someone says, well, when will I know if it's time to take the car keys away? Well, if, you're dri if your patient's driving on the same roads I am and you're asking that question, you're probably already at the point where we begin to need to think more rationally and more reasonably. But you can't just have a big argument with an Alzheimer patient. You can't explain that to them. You have to think of better ways. So, you know, monitoring the patient in the early, early stages of the disease, only allowing them to drive to certain places. But I cannot tell you how many of our patients have gotten lost going to the very familiar hairdressers that lives right down the road, the church that they've been going to for 20 years. Just because it's it's a short distance and they've done it a long time. You can't always be assured that that's safe to continue to drive. So the best response is letting your doctor help you make that decision and out of sight, out of mind. The car is just not in the driveway anymore. Those are the ways you have to help. Patients and acceptance. You know, a lot of us say, you know, I, 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 my husband just won't. My, he just won't go to bed. He just won't do this. He just won't. No, mm -mm. you have to understand he has a condition now and we're forgiving them that behavior 100% of the time. It's all on us. So we have to understand it's not that he won't do, it's that he can't do. He can't do because of a disease process. Back in the beginning, I showed you two pictures of a brain. And take those pictures home with you and think about, you know, that's the reason he can't do it. It's not that he won't do it. And so the best response is to convey that you're safe, I love you, you're just fine. That's what you always want to convey with an Alzheimer patient. Um, Lila says, after telling her my name repeatedly, she still did not understand. And finally I said, I'm your daughter. And her response was, what's a daughter? Um, Betty just lost her mom last week. Um, she cared for her mother for 14 years. Uh, Betty got um, continence products that we delivered to the door um, for, for her mom for about 10 years. Um, that's a really long time on that program. Uh, Betty provided an extraordinary level of care and I've had great privilege to get to know her over the years. And, um, you know, I asked her if it was okay if I told this story. You know, she had a, 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 got to a place at one point where they were at the drugstore across the street were selling um, sample diapers, a pack of sample diapers. There was a small, a medium, and a large, and it cost $2.89. And she was scrounging the house looking for change to buy diapers, a pack of diapers, two of which weren't going to fit her mother. And so when Alzheimer's of Central Alabama get, began to provide those products to her, it really made a difference in her life. And it really allowed her to be able to continue to care for her mom and to be able to continue to, to care for her mom at home, which was what she chose to do. And Buddy, I can tell you, that smile on her face was on her face all the time. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, so that final stage is the, pa is the patients who need nursing care. So again, if we're thinking about our Alzheimer patients who have gone from needing supervision, who have needed custodial care, our, our, our final stage patients need nursing care. And that's not to say that nurses are providing it because a lot of us at home are providing this kind of very intimate care. And again, this really is so important for that caregiver to begin to, uh, to be sure that they've reached out and looked into all avenues of support that they are continuing to seek medical advice and maybe see if their loved one is appropriate for hospice care because when you can get on hospice care is the day you ought to do it um, because it's good care. I've had families who are on hospice care for a while, their patient improves and they go off and then they get back on. That's still a great way to use that level of care. And so it's important to work with your physician because that's a time when you really need those resources. Um, you know, I'm, we're getting so close to the end here, and this is really what I've got to tell you. Um, I want you to remember as you go forth, and that's the ministry of presence. Because there are so many times that you will come across someone in need, and I'm not necessarily just talking about dementia patients. I'm just talking about people in general with need, with, with heartbreak, with loss, and there's not 
always something you can do for them, but you can offer the ministry of presence because that doesn't cost anything. And that's what our Alzheimer patients need more than anything. They need us to be present with them in their journey. They need us to comfort them and they need us to understand them. Now there's our sweet Ruby. Um, this is a more recent picture, as I said, of Ruby. And her daughter says, I think I'm in a place of not giving up, but just trying not to give out and get through it with grace and dignity for my mother. It's the hardest thing I've ever, had, ever done, and it's the one thing I want to do the very best I can and with no regrets. The newest member to our family, mother's baby doll. It's brought us joy and laughter, and who would have thought that? Um, that is Ruby at our Alzheimer's walk, and Ruby's doll is actually wearing an Alzheimer's of Central Alabama t-shirt and a balloon hat, so you can't get much better than that. You know, I really believe that there are a lot of positive aspects to caregiving. Um, when you start thinking about Alzheimer's disease and how difficult it is and how long it is, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there's lots of positives that come out of it. You know, Juno, who does the support group here, and, and I probably share in, in um, seeing the wonderful transformative power that can happen for some caregivers as they go through this Alzheimer's experience, where they really have a, a sense of fortitude and they, a sense of accomplishment over the things that they're able to do for their loved one. And this is a difficult journey, but you're not alone. There's organizations like Alzheimer's of Central Alabama. There are wonderful ministries like here at this church and in other churches in our community. There are resources like adult daycares and home health agencies. And you've really got to do your best to look out for the things that are available to you that can help you and to remain centered on the things that you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, that successful journey... Um, uh, successful caregiving, these are the things to pack in your survival kit and keep that humor right there at the top. You know, it is, it is really important. We call that vitamin H. Be sure you get a dose of it every day. Um, not, there's maybe not a lot to laugh about about Alzheimer's, but there's a lot to laugh about in just the, 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 the interesting things that can happen and the interesting things that a dementia patient can do. And again, that's why it's great to connect with others who have this disease so that you can gain a little perspective and see things in a more happy light. Advanced planning is also so important. Um, but your most important ingredient, I, I want to tell you, is that respite care. It's, it's not going the journey all by yourself. Don't fly solo on this one. Get whatever help that you can. And again, I want to tell you that Alzheimer's of Central Alabama, we're your local organization. We're not an association. We're your local organization that provides local help for local families and has for over 21 years. Um, this is a painting that was actually, again, Belle, you're getting a good, a good shout out and, and um, an advertisement here today, but this painting was painted by a group of Alzheimer patients at, at, um, at Mel's daycare. We um, have loved this picture so much, we put it on um, birthday cards that we send to our caregivers that are on our service programs, and it's up there to remind me to tell you these are the things that are happening with us. As I said, we have a major fundraiser Saturday night at Iron City. Um, it's a live and silent auction. You can go on our website, which you do have buried deep in here on about the second page, I think, um, in our, at our website if you want more information because we have never had a better auction of cool, cool stuff. Um, and I hope we have cool, cool crowd of people to come and bid on all of it because we have to raise money to provide those services for our patients. But then most importantly, I want to tell you about the conference. It's on June 23rd. Um, and again, you can register for that on our website. It's an all-day program, and I, I see this short format works really well, but if you've got a whole day to, to come and join with us, we're going to talk some about the things that I've already talked about. We'll have a physician to give us an overview of the dementia. But then I think it's great and really important that we're going to hear from some of those researchers at UAB who are, are with us in the fight um, against Alzheimer's disease because all of us want to see... Um, better treatment, uh, better cure, better diagnosis of this disease. So thank you so much, and thank you, Debbie, for having me here today.